when you're in a toxic relationship, you see the person who is giving the toxicity as the toxic person. Mm. But if I'm in that type of relationship, I have to realize that I am also a toxic person. Yes. Because I'm tolerating it. I'm allowing it into my life. I'm I'm engaging it. Born in 92 on the block with the sharks. Come from a different cloth. Y'all will get ripped apart. You want a diamond, then you gotta get it in the dark. We dropping nuggets like Carmelo with the rock of Paul. Now we eat it from state to state. We scrape the plate. I put my eggs in the basket. Took a leap of faith. I took a chance. Now we grow and see the impact. Decoding success with special guests. Now let's bring match. Deborah, welcome to the show. Excited to have you. Excited to decode your success and talk about an array of different topics today. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. Now, first question for you. This is how we kick off every show. I might sound like a parrot now at this point, almost uh, 190 plus episodes <laughs> in. Um, how does Deborah personally define success? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I definitely don't define it. That's where I'll start with what I don't define it as. I don't define it as climbing up the ladder. I don't define it as how many followers I have on Instagram, downloads my podcast has, books I've sold, blog hits. I definitely don't define it by those things because I've noticed over the years that that measuring stick is so fleeting. It's like a roller coaster. And if I measure my success by those things, it's going to fail me every time, you know? So I guess I would say I measure my success by the joy and fulfillment and purpose that I have in the day-to-day -day things, the day-to-day -day life, you know, my kids, my husband, being outside, enjoying nature, my health, you know, the more that I feel like I'm embracing and enjoying the day-to-day, -day, the more I feel like I'm succeeding. And there's a backstory to that because I've also been, in dark places. And when you've been in dark places, the everyday things are such a success and such a joy. So that's where I'm at right now. I love that. My next question was going to be, you kind of beat me to it. What were the people or person or events that may have shaped that definition of success? And uh, you know, you just alluded to being in some dark places, but I know I personally get caught up in the followers or, you know, the materials or whatever. Listen, it's pretty natural, right? Yeah. Uh, it's almost primal to an extent. So I'm curious, like, what was it that shaped your definition of success? Yeah. Honestly, I have to go back to my faith. Um, you know, my faith in God and the reminder that my measuring stick is not what I'm doing for people, but what God has done for me and in my life and what I can do for others. And so that's a big part of why I do what I do. I'm a licensed counselor, you know, that's my job. And I feel like having that perspective of being able to help people just as I have been helped over the years, um, that's really shaped my view. And do, do I grind? Do I do my best? Do I try to get followers? Do I try to put out a best-selling book. Of course, I'm going to try to do those things, but I always come back to, this isn't what defines me. Mm. This is just the overflow of who I am. I love that. Now, where did your faith come from? Was it something that you grew up in or did it come to you in a certain way? I would say I grew up with it, but when you grow up with faith, I don't know, there's a lot of emotions and issues that you have to struggle with because sure. it's like, is this really mine? Just because I grew up with it, does it actually make it mine? Um, and then over the years, you know, my faith background is Christianity and there's has definitely been some um, issues come from that over the years, politically, personally. And, and my question is, who do I want to define myself as? What does it look like for me to be a follower of God? So there had to be a turning point in my life where I actually embraced that for myself. My relationship with God became something that I was working on, not something that had been passed down to me. And I would say that happened around college for me, a young adulthood, millennial, when I was a millennial, you know, I guess uh, I still am on the tail end of a millennial. So I don't want to make <laughs> myself older than I am. I love that. Now, I actually really respect that too, because I've seen my faith develop 
And I think it's important. Listen, I'm, I'm born into a Roman Catholic household, an Italian mother, uh, you know, a French father. So that's just embodied in what they've done. But seeing your faith develop is really cool. Now, you said it happened to you in college um, where you kind of just started to take it on for yourself. What was it in particular in college? Was it just saying like, all right, cool, like this is in my control now? No, actually, it was after going through a really difficult season with um, a relationship. Um, you know, I, I, I have a feeling you might be able to relate to this and many others, but I, sometimes you spend so much of your time trying to find the right one Mm. that you lose yourself in the process, you know? And so for me, excuse me, for me going through that season and having to, then after this breakup really define who I was standing alone not who I was in relationship, who I was standing alone. I think that was a really defining moment for me because I had to begin to download truths about my identity standing alone, not my identity wrapped up in a relationship and become healthy standing alone. And I always say that healthy people make healthy relationships. Right. So if you want to take a a gauge of how healthy you are, just look at your relationships, you know, look at how you're engaging with people on the regular, Mm. because that's going to give you an inside scoop into who you are and how you're doing. Because we engage with people on our personal level of health, right? We attract people on our personal level of health. So for me, that process was crucial and where my relationship with God really became a big part of my life. Now, when you talk about having healthy relationships, you're not just talking about intimate relationships, like you're talking across the board, friendships, et cetera, right? Yeah, across the board. I think intimate relationships is where we tend to see it the most because those are the most intimate and they magnify everything. It's like intimate relationships are like a pressure cooker. Mm. Everything you bring into them is going to blow up in your face times a (laughs) hundred, the good and the bad. Right. Right. And so I think intimate relationships is where we see it the most, but this formula healthy people make healthy relationships applies to all of our relationships. I love that. Now, I know that you're a counselor. You work primarily with, you know, the relationship space, dating, marriage, uh, even some mental health stuff. I'm curious, like, what do you find are the top three relationship issues? And I'm curious because um, I've asked this question before to, to many experts and professionals in the field. I'm just curious to see what you have experienced. Well, I would say number one, right off the bat, are people who don't really know who they are and haven't worked on themselves. So the biggest work on yourself, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify that the biggest relationship problem is I'm not dealing with my own junk. I'm not dealing with my own baggage. I love you already, Deborah. I swear. Because you can't control anybody outside of yourself. Right. I mean, you're 50% of the equation of a healthy relationship and it's so much easier to focus on the relationship it's a lot harder to focus on myself. What is my role? But if you have no role, you also have no control. Mm. So I want to have a role so that I can have power in this relationship. I can have impact in this relationship. So the number one mistake is people who haven't taken the time to do the work. When I say do the work, that's where the conversation about mental and emotional health comes. I'm talking about dealing with your past baggage. I'm talking about your childhood wounds. I'm talking about your false beliefs about yourself because you carry that junk into relationships. You know, I, I worked with a couple, this, this guy who literally like, imagine with me, this bald guy, super ripped, tons of tattoos. And he's not the type of guy you imagine in a counseling scenario. Right. Right. Here he is in my counseling office with his wife and they're having these big fights. Every time she tells him to do something, he explodes. Like, what do you think? I'm an idiot. Of course I'm going to do it. You know, stop nagging me, get off my back. And she's like, I'm just like, it's just something small. Like we were working in the garden the other day and I asked him if he's going to pull the weeds and he flipped Mm. and he, and he's got this constant reaction where he flips. What is it here? So as a, as a relationship counselor, I can start by saying, okay, guys, let's talk about some communication skills and let's work on some anger management. That's not going to do squat for them if we don't get to the root of what the problem is because all of us when we've got a problem in the present 
it's rooted in something deeper, especially when you have such an emotional reaction. I call them our emotional sore spots. Mm. They're already sore. They're black and blue. When somebody touches it, it hurts even more because it's already sore before they got there. So for this guy, we start unpacking some of his past. And I asked him, tell me what you feel when your wife tells you to do something. And he said, it makes me feel like she thinks I'm not good enough. Like I'm inadequate in some way. Mm. And I said to him, well, talk me through a time that you felt that same feeling in your past. Have you ever experienced that? And he got real quiet, looked at the floor, started kind of shuffling his feet. And he started telling me, he said, I grew up in a house where my dad was so strict and it was my way or the highway kind of thing. Everything I did, nothing I ever did was good enough for him until one day at the age of 16, we had a, a blowout and we came head to head and I left and I've never turned back since. Wow. And in that moment, this grown tattooed man started to weep. He said, I was never good enough for him. And whenever this woman, this wife of his tells him to do something, it hits that sore spot that he feels like he's not good enough. It's not actually her. It's his past wounds that he's carried into that relationship that's causing that emotional explosion. Right. So when we don't deal with our junk, this is exactly the kind of stuff that starts to come out in our relationships. And we think it's a relationship issue when really it's a single person issue. I just haven't dealt with my stuff, you know, yeah. whether it's anxiety, whether it's explosive reactions, miscommunication, deceit, dishonesty, addictions, whatever, you know what I mean? A hundred percent. So numerous questions coming about here. The first is, do you see the lack of healing more in men or in women? Mm, I would say more in men okay, because of a, a lack of insight, a lack of desire to go there, a lack of understanding. And I think it's because our culture tells men, you're not supposed to have feelings. You're not supposed to cry. You're supposed to just act tough, be tough, be a man. These false gender types that really screw us up in the end because they make men think they're supposed to look like something. But, but then again, I mean, I, I see a whole lot of unhealthy women. So right. it's hard to say because I definitely see relationships where the unhealthy party is not defined to one gender. I, I definitely agree with you. I asked that question because first and foremost, we actually just put out an episode recently, numerous. Um, I actually just started therapy almost a year ago. Good and for you. It, it's literally revolutionized my life. And I've been using this platform almost 200 episodes in to kind of amplify that. So like, I'm really grateful that we're talking about this right now. Um, we actually put out an episode recently. It was four gentlemen, myself and three other gentlemen doing like a little round table and just having like a super transparent, vulnerable conversation about like what masculinity has like been shaped to be. Oh, so good. I love no. that. I love yeah. it. So the other part of it that makes me so curious is that I have personally, just from discussions like this, have learned that experts and professionals just like yourself have witnessed a lot of women who have been through traumatic relationships, whether they were abused physically, emotionally, mentally, etc. They are also very prone to not healing after that. Yeah. So that, that's why I asked that question. But you kind of hit the nail on the head. You were like, I also see a lot of women that go through that as well. It's true. And, and when you, when you're in a toxic relationship, you see the person who is giving the toxicity as the toxic person. Mm. But if I'm in that type of relationship, I have to realize that I am also a toxic person Yes, because I'm tolerating it. I'm allowing it into my life. I'm I'm engaging in it, right? So, so there, that's why both parties have to take responsibility. You engage and attract in the type of relationship you believe you deserve. Mm. So if you're in a toxic relationship, what does that tell me about your beliefs about yourself? And we got to start changing. It's not about just getting out of the relationship. It's about getting to the roots of why I'm in it in the first place. Exactly. And what do I actually believe about myself? And how do I break the cycle and patterns, you know? 
So it, it's such a complex but beautiful conversation. Um, and I think I love it so much because I know as a counselor, there's healing on the other side for those who want it. Right. Now, it's not easy to set that boundary, though, right? Especially like when when I first realized that I was experiencing something very similar to what we're discussing now, it was never easy to actually let go, right? And to actually say, all right, Matt, like, listen, you're you're not being treated how you know you deserve to be treated, right? So like setting that boundary, what's your advice in regards to that? I think my first question to you, I'm going to turn the tables on you now. We're going to oh, turn this into a counseling session. My first question to you would be, when you say not easy to let it go, what do you mean by that and why? So for me, and again, I'll speak from a personal perspective here from my experience. For me, it was, I didn't want to let the person go. Or like, I didn't want, I didn't want to give up on the relationship. And I didn't know this at the time. It was actually brought to my attention at a dinner recently, but I never read the book, uh, Men Are From Mars, when Women Are From Venus. Have you ever read that? I haven't. I but, have read it. I have yeah. my own thoughts about it, but I have read it. Okay, cool. So, um, apparently the premise of the the men's side of it was that we wanted to solve problems. And I don't know if it was me viewing that as I wanted to change that person and I wanted to solve that problem. I don't know what it was to be honest, but I just never wanted to let go or give up. So that's what we have to get to the bottom to uh, because that's, what's going to begin to impact you in the future and make change. And I said, I read men are from Mars, women are from Venus, or is it men are from Venus, women are from Mars, what, whatever, we're from different planets. (laughs) <laughs> all that to say, I don't think it's a gender thing. I think mm. this is how we were raised. This is our childhood wounds that we carry, the experiences that we have. You know, some people grow up in a family where they are the rescuer. Like their role in the family is to keep the peace, to be the comedian, to make sure everybody's getting along. And because of that, they develop this savior complex. Like Mm -hmm. I have to help people. I I'm here to pick up the pieces, right? I'm here to solve this thing. And then they carry that identity into relationships. So they have a tendency then to find themselves in relationships that are in need of fixing and take on that role. But in the end, it's not a healthy role to have because healthy relationships are not one-sided. It's not one person fixing and the other person receiving it's got to be give and take. Relationships are like plants. If you give a plant too much water, it will die. If you give it too little water, it will also die. So when we're in a relationship and we're giving too much without getting anything in return, that relationship's going to die. You know, I think sometimes we think of the opposite of not giving enough in a relationship but very little of us realize that we are killing the relationship by giving too much, you know? Yeah. And so to answer that question for someone listening, we'd have to really get to the root of why is it so hard for you to let go? What is that underlying fear? Is it a fear of failure? Is it a fear of rejection? Is it a fear of saying that you haven't succeeded? Is it a fear of being alone? Because when we can get to that underlying fear and what the root really is, we can start doing that work. And when we do that work, we, we deal with the root of the issue. And now it's much easier to let go because I understand what's been holding me back. Right. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. I'm curious, why do you think people avoid the healing? Is it because they don't know how to? Like, I'm just curious, like, what is your thought process there? I think first and foremost... They don't know how to, um, we're not wired to learn how to do that. And, and not only that with, with millennial culture, like we live in a, a, a world where social media is king and everything we put on Facebook, Instagram, it's like these, these little snapshots of our picture, perfect lives. We kind of live in this superficial of who we are. And we kind of just assume that's all there is. We kind of learn to stay there in the superficial. So nobody is really pushing us to get real about how we're doing. The title of my new book is called, Are You Really Okay? And I found that people have two different responses to that. The first group says, man, I am not okay. I need this book because I just, I want to get better or I'm not sure if I'm okay. So I really want to, I really want to get get to the bottom of this. The other group, which concerns me more, 
say, I'm good. I'm good. You know, there's nothing here to work on. I'm good. I'm all right. How are you? You know, and that to me is more concerning because they're not even aware that there's work to be done. There's no, they're not even aware that there's a next layer of healing that happens. So partly we're conditioned not to go there, but for those of us who want to go there, we don't always know what to do. Mm -hmm. We don't have a guide to help us. And that's my heart for this message is to be that guide. I, I want to talk people through it, not just as a licensed counselor, but as a, a person who has journeyed through those hard things, you know, and gotten right. came out the other side. What if someone knows that, that they need to do that type of work, but they just don't. I, I've experienced numerous people like that. They, they say, I need to do soul searching, or uh, I, I know I need to hire a therapist, but they just choose not to. It's almost as if they're like scared to see what's on the other side of that. Like it's so unknown to them that they just, you know, are so comfortable where they're at. I would say that's the majority of people. Right. They, they know there's something, but it's too painful to go there or it's too much work. And so they numb and they repress and they ignore all of those hard feelings. But human beings are like a volcano. All that built up emotion and stress, rejection, fears, worries, insecurities, all of those hard emotions are building pressure underneath the surface. And just like a volcano, when enough pressure builds, what's going to happen is it will come and find the point of least resistance and you will find yourself having an emotional explosion. Mm. For some people, that emotional explosion looks like major depression, anxiety, anger or rage, addictions, relationship problems, whatever. For each person, it's going to look different. But the problem is if we are not willing to do that work, it's going to come back and bite us in the butt eventually. Maybe it hasn't happened yet, but you can only ignore it for so long. You can only pretend you're okay for so long until you're not. Right. And I want to help people prevent that. Like part of this is preventative maintenance. You don't wait till your car dies to take it into the mechanic. You start doing that work pre- preventatively. You get the oil changed. Make sure you're getting your car checked up. Why do we not do that for our own hearts oh, and souls? You know? A hundred percent. So you had mentioned your book. I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Are you really okay getting real about who you are, how you're doing and why it matters? So you talked about why you wrote the book already, which I'm I'm super grateful for that. Like that's an amazing act of service. I absolutely love it. But on top of that, how do people get real about who they truly are? Like what, what does that entail? There's a psychologist, one of the founding fathers of psychology that I talk about in this book. One of the chapters is called, my name is blank. And there's a blank there because we've yet to fill it in. The founding father of psychology's name was John Locke. And he came up with this theory called the tabula rasa theory, which in Latin, it means the blank slate theory. And basically he theorizes that when human beings are born, we're born into the world and our identity is like a blank slate. We don't know who we are, but as we go through life, people begin to inform our beliefs about ourselves. They begin to inform our identity by the things they say to us. And all of a sudden our blank slate becomes filled with these labels, these words of who people have told us we are. Right. The problem is some of those words are not true. There's some good stuff there maybe, but there's also some downright ugly lies that get put on us. Just like that man I talked about earlier, believing that he's not good enough, you know, and we can begin living out of those false labels. We can begin holding onto them for so long that we start believing them. And then we start living out of them. So how I kind of conceptualize this is that part of the process of identity and figuring out who we really are is facing that blank slate, which is no longer blank, facing those words one by one and removing the lies, figuring out where they came from and how long we've been carrying them. And then we start replacing them with the truth Mm -hmm. of who we really are. 
that's where my faith has been a big part of my life. Because personally, for me, a big part of, a, of my identity is who God says I am. And that has been a founding part of my life. I am loved. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. You know, God is for me. I have a plan. I have a purpose for my life. These are the things that I hold on to for my identity. And I begin to replace the lies that have been put on me over the years, because I don't want to live out of that stuff anymore, you know? Right, right. I love that. I really, really love that. How long does that process typically take, in your opinion? Well, it's definitely not overnight. (laughs) I wish it was. I wish it was. You know, I feel like it's a daily process. Mm. Um, In fact, one of my dear friends and mentors, her name's Christine Kane. She says, I am one thought away from going back to the life that I used to live. Right. Because this is a daily process of changing my thoughts and making sure that I am focused on truth in my day-to-day life. What am I believing about myself? What am I speaking over myself. Right. And, and, and it's not something that you just replace overnight, but the beautiful thing about the brain is that it's malleable. We can change the shape and function of our brain. Our thought processes create these neural pathways in our brain. It's almost like if you think about a river and the water coming down a river, every time more water comes down the river bank, gets deeper and deeper and deeper. That groove gets deeper and deeper. That's how our brain works. Every time we have these negative thoughts, I am not good enough. I am not good enough. It continues to make that groove a little bit deeper, that neural pathway. So it's easier to think that thought. Right. So how do I change that neural pathway? I begin by changing the thought. Then the water goes down a different path. I create a new neural pathway. And the first time around, that riverbank isn't going to be very deep. That neural pathway is brand new. It's easy to like go back to the old one. But the more I practice telling myself the truth, the more I practice believing the truth, pouring it over my life, speaking it over my life, speaking it out loud, replacing the lies, the deeper that neural pathway gets, I actually begin to change the shape and function of my brain Mm -hmm. and begin to believe these things more readily, more quickly. I'm in more in control of my thoughts than I used to be. And that's why the process of therapy is so important because somebody is calling you out and pointing out the truth versus the lies and kind of helping you sort through some of this stuff. Right. You also just answered my next question. It's so funny because before you got into it, I was asking myself, I'm like, why is it so easy to go backward as opposed to forward? Like you were just- it's so freaking easy. And I, I was referring to my physical health. Um, I have like a total dad bod right now, but uh, I did like a 75 day program and I was ripped and I was looking great. And then I'm looking at myself now. I'm like, dude, it's because you started eating pizza. It's because you started eating donuts and just like fell right back into it. But um, yeah, that you explained it. So I appreciate you beating me to it. Um, outside of that though, what is your advice for someone to check in with themselves? to like yeah. really find out if they're actually okay, as opposed to just saying it without, you know, meaning and it's just fluff. Well, this is a, not a quick cookie cutter answer because there's nothing I can say that would, would really do justice to that question. But I will tell you a starting point is to begin the process of journaling. Okay. Because when we start to journal, we're facing our thoughts, we're facing our emotions, we're facing our interactions, we're facing our behaviors, right? When we start putting it down on paper, it becomes real. We can't hide from it anymore. When when you read, are you really okay? You don't just read through it. You work through it. At the end of each chapter, I have this five minute checkup and you're going to see that it's all journaling questions. Actually, let me open it up here and and, and ask you some of the questions. Yeah, please. For the, for the first emotional checkup, one of the questions is this. What are the triggers, problems, struggles, stressors, or adjustments and changes that I find myself dealing with today? Which is basically answering the question of what problems do I have in my present? Mm. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most uncomfortable stress and pressure How much pressure do I feel like I'm dealing with right now underneath the surface? What emotions do I present to the world 
versus what emotions are actually going on inside. So, so these are just three out of, out of the first six questions in just chapter one, right? Because each chapter we're going to stop and check up. We're going to journal. We're going to really take inventory about how I'm doing. We go to the doctor to get physical checkups on a regular basis, whether or not we want to we get our annuals. When you get a little bit older, you got to go in for mammograms and all kinds of stuff, right? But how often do we stop and do an emotional checkup right. or a mental checkup or a spiritual checkup? Like, do we ever stop to do that? Or do we just go, go, go until it dies, mm-hmm. you know? So that's what I'm hoping it if nothing else, that this gets us to begin that process of stopping to pause and check in. We don't take the time to pause because our lives are so full of distractions. Yeah. You're driving in the car, you've got your music on, you've got your podcasts on, you're sitting on the toilet and you're scrolling through your phone. Like you don't even, <laughs> people don't even give themselves a second to right. breathe and think and go deeper right before bed, you're, you're, you're literally on your phone till the second you turn off the lights and go to bed, you wake up, you pick up your phone again. Where do we even have the time to check in? Because we're just so busy distracting ourselves, staying up here instead of going down there, you know? Now, my question to that is those questions were phenomenal. I love them. But what if someone just lies to themselves, right? Because I've personally found it easier to lie to myself than lie to someone else. Yeah. So like, you have to keep it real, but I don't know, maybe people would prefer to lie in those situations. I'm sure a lot of people lie to themselves, but here's the problem with that. If you're lying to yourself, you are not ready for healing. A hundred percent agree. You're not ready. You're not there. You know, I talk about a study called the better than average effect where they asked a group of people to, to rate themselves on a scale of how moral are you? How kind are you? How good of a driver are you? The majority of people rated themselves as better than average, right. but you can't have the majority of people. Somebody has got to be below the mean mathematically right. speaking, it doesn't compute. And then they went to a group of prisoners and asked them the same questions because they're like, maybe just high educated people are the ones that think of themselves as better than average. Let's take this study to prisoners and see what they say. So they asked prisoners, how are you compared to your non-prisoner peers in morality and kindness? Prisoners rated themselves as better than average. Really? We have a tendency to see ourselves as better than average. This is called the better than average effect. We have a tendency to lie to ourselves, to see ourselves through a filter of, of a rose colored lens where we just gloss over our junk. And if you're at that point, I'm hoping this conversation is starting to challenge you to say, you know what, maybe I do need to look, dig a little deeper, but if you're still not there, if you still hear the question, are you really okay? And your first answer without thinking is, yeah, I'm good. Then you're not ready to heal. Right. You're not at that place. And there's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do to help them get there. Unfortunately, what happens is you go till you break. Mm. And that's what I see in my office. People who were good. I'm good until they're not. Right. But for the rest of us, we can actually begin that process. We can actually begin doing that work, that preventative maintenance right now, right here. Yeah. I love this. Now, if someone that's reading this book can only take away one thing from it, what would you want that one thing to be and why? Oh man, that's a hard question. I mean, I could tell there's already a plethora of knowledge and wisdom and amazing stuff in here. So I understand it's definitely not easy. I would summarize it by saying, I want people to realize that healing is holistic. It's not this one component a lot of times we focus on one aspect of healing. We focus on physical health. We focus on our bodies. We focus on our diet. That's usually what people focus on, right? But if we're neglecting spiritual health, emotional health, mental health, there's a body mind connection. And if you're neglecting the other aspects, then you aren't actually becoming as healthy as you can be because they all work together. That's why I I broke this book up into four sections, emotional health, spiritual health, mental health, and physical health. 
because I want everybody to see health as a holistic thing. It's not just one piece to the puzzle. What's the difference between emotional and mental health? Emotional health is more of understanding and expressing our feelings. Okay. Mental health is more taking inventory of our thought life, the thoughts that we repeat to ourselves, as well as how they're affecting our brain when it comes to our chemical makeup, because your thoughts impact what's happening in your brain. They impact your neurochemicals. So when you're too stressed out because you have all these unhealthy thoughts, it's going to affect your brain. Right. And, and for some people, that chemical imbalance causes depression, anxiety. For some people, they're going to need therapy. And for some people, they're going to need medication mm -hmm. to start the process of getting back into equilibrium so they can begin to tackle those thoughts. They can begin to deal with those unhealthy feelings, you know, and those relationships. So right. mental health is really about understanding how our brain works. Um, I talk about the different parts of the brain, like the amygdala and the neocortex and what each of them do and the role in trauma and anxiety. And, you know, there's all, I mean, we could talk about this stuff for hours, I'm sure, but um, that's the difference. I would say one focuses on our emotions and our emotional expression. The other focuses on our, on our mind and the way that our brain is working. I love that. Thank you so much for breaking that down. Uh, I'm sure you've done a ton of podcasts. You've been on stages. Obviously you've wrote books. What is a question you wish more people would ask you? Hmm. Well, about anything. That is a good question. I think because I'm in the relationship space, I get a lot of relationship questions, right? And I love it. I love talking about it. I have a hotline style podcast called love and relationships. People call in with relationship questions. I answer them and I love it. I really do. But I wish that people would start asking questions that are a little bit more internal about their personal health and well-being, their role in the relationship rather than, Hey, here's my relationship problem. Let's solve it. Mm. I'd rather them come to me with, Hey, here's my problem. How can we work through this? This is what I bring to the table. How can you help me with this? Because people who are already at that point are so far ahead of the game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like when you're coming to me and you want to work on yourself, you are so far ahead of the game when it comes to having a healthy relationship. Now, before you met your husband, what do you feel like was the main thing you needed to work on before you, you know, got into that relationship, then marriage? 100% my identity. I talked about that breakup that I went through and that season of really having to figure out who I was, because if you don't know who you are, you don't know what you need in a relationship. You don't know what matches your life from what doesn't, you know, when it comes to relationships, human beings are kind of like a puzzle. If you imagine two puzzle pieces, right? You're, let's just say you're doing a puzzle. You pick up a piece. That's you. And you look at the, the, the floor, there's a million other pieces. You just choose one and you try to cram it in. That's how we do relationships sometimes. Right. It's like blindly like, oh, let's see if this works. <laughs> and it usually causes brokenness and pain and it doesn't fit. The only way I'm going to know what's a good relationship for me, the only way I'm going to know what I need is when I know who I am, because then I know my shape then I know my colors and I can recognize from a distance if that person's going to fit into my life or not. Right. And that was my problem. When I got into this one long-term relationship that I talk about that ended it with a breakup, it's not like he was a horrible person. I just didn't know who I was. So I was trying to cram this relationship into my life that did not match me or my life. It wasn't good for me. So when I took that time after that breakup, to really figure out who I was standing alone. When I met my husband, so quickly I recognized this guy's gonna be a good fit for me. I just know it because I know who I am. I know what I need. I know what I want. And sure enough, he has been the best fit I could have ever asked for. He is my partner, my number one fan, the man behind the scenes. We have a beautiful family and I'm just so grateful that I knew who I was standing alone, that he knew who he was standing alone, because otherwise it would have been a train wreck. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Not that we don't have things we have to work through, but now we can work through them as two mature, 
whole people. We're not relying on each other to fill one another up. We are whole people standing alone. And what we offer to this relationship is the overflow of who we are, you know? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's amazing. Uh, I could talk to you for days. I know that I need to let you go in a few minutes. So I'm going to ask you two questions. We always ask these two questions on the way out of the episodes. Okay. First one being, what is a piece of advice that Deborah received but didn't want to hear, but it proved to be true over time? Ooh. I will tell you, I know exactly what comes to mind. When I was younger, my dad and I got into a little bit of a fight and I remember kind of emotionally derailing and kind of flipping on him and he's quiet he's not the type of person who yells or screams he's a really great person and I remember he looked at me and said how you're reacting now is a sign of how you're going to react in future relationships if you don't control your emotional response right and I'm like whatever that's I'm, I'm reacting this way. Cause you're driving me crazy. You know, I'm, I'm in my feisty <laughs> stage. Right. But sure enough, fast forward. I remember the first fight I got into with John, when I actually had an emotional, like explosion, I, the same type of unhealthy response I had years ago, I had a flashback in that moment where my dad was like, you got to work on this because if you don't deal with this, you're going to deal with it later. And sure enough, there it was. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he was right. Like I have to deal with my own junk because here I am blaming. If you blame it on the other person and you take no role, like I said earlier, then you have no control. Mm -hmm. And so these little moments in my life, you kind of see how they've shaped the big picture of what I believe and what I know to be true about relationships. And I've had to live it out. Yeah, clearly. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I definitely appreciate that. Last question for you, Deborah. If you could only give one piece of advice the rest of your life, like if you could only write, you know, books on this one topic, podcasts on this one topic, speak on it, et cetera, what is that one piece of advice you'd give? Get healthy standing alone. Get healthy standing alone. That's 100% what I would preach from the rooftops because when we do that, it changes everything. If we want to change the world, we start by changing ourselves. If we want to change our marriage, we start by changing ourselves. If we want to change our family, we start by changing ourselves. If we want to change culture, we start by changing ourselves. That's where it's got to begin. It's so much easier to look at other people, but it's so much less effective because we can't control them. Right. We can only control what we bring to the table. And so that's 100% hands down will be is and will be my message until the day I die. I love it. I love it. I've honestly enjoyed this so much. I'm so grateful for this. I'm going to make sure all of the social links, websites where individuals can get this book, everything will be in the show notes of this episode. But do you have anything else going on that you want to make people aware of that we might not have talked about? Yeah, you know, one thing that I that I've done with Are You Really Okay is a podcast series, cool. where I've kind of turned the table on some of the top leaders, specifically spiritual leaders, and, and have asked them to tell me how they're doing. How are you really doing emotionally and spiritually? Because I believe that a lot of this change has to come from the top down. Mm -hmm. And some of those conversations with some really significant influential people have really been eye opening. And I think inspiring to a lot of people to realize we can take down the stigma and we can ask that question. Are you really okay? And we have permission to answer honestly. And you can find that at my podcast, which is Love and Relationships. Cool. Yeah, I'll make sure that there's a link in the show notes for that as well. But I've absolutely loved this, Deborah. Thank you so much for hopping on here. We definitely appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Born in 92 on the block with the sharks. Come from a different cloth. Y'all would get ripped apart. You want a diamond, then you got to get it in the dark. We dropping nuggets like Carmelo with the rock of Now we eating from state.